All right, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rasi Bullock. And the pleasure is greater because he actually needs no introduction to this group. Uh, I think Darcy came to Purdue shortly after I did, 1998. One semester after, that's right. One semester after, so 1998, January, he was here. And uh, he's been with us ever since. He's a professor, and he's also a registered professional engineer. He works in the area of traffic engineering as, uh, also, and continues to serve as director of the Joint Transportation Research Program. Uh, you know, as part of his work, he interacts closely with vendors, U.S. BOT personnel, and also with colleagues within and outside Purdue. And uh, uh, today he's going to give us a talk, sort of summarizing what he's been doing, where he thinks he's going to be going. Uh, I wanted to also inform you that Darcy is a very accomplished researcher, with lots of awards to his credits. I'm not going to read the entire list, otherwise we'll simply have to directly go to questions after that. But I do want to mention that he was the recipient of the American Society of Civil Engineers Wellington Prize in 2010. He has had numerous best paper awards from the Transportation Research Board. Uh, I also want to mention a couple of Purdue level awards. The Purdue College of Engineering Faculty Awards of Excellence, the team award, Darcy was part of the JTRP team that received the award last year. And also more recently, he was recognized with the Purdue University Office of Engagement, the Faculty Engagement, Faculty Fellow Engagement Award in 2016. So with that, Darcy, uh, let me take over the floor and we're anxious to listen to you. So, uh, th thank you, Gia. So what I wanted, to, this is kind of the outline of the talk that I'm going to go through. And this was kind of our, this was the hard, the, the technical part was easy to do on this talk. That front matter of kind of setting the stage, I'll tell you, I, like, that was the part that, that I had the hardest part because this was kind of a diverse, group, so I agonized a little bit on it, and I thought, I think I'm glad the Dean's office is here, the communication folks, I think that uh, maybe will set some stage uh, for some of this. Um, so um, this land grant mission thing, you know, I'd like to tell you like when I was an undergrad at the University of Vermont in like the 1980s that I knew what that was and I knew that was my career path, but I was at a presentation that Vic Lechtenberg gave maybe like four or five years ago, he talked about Senator Morrow from Vermont, and all of a sudden like the pin dropped in my head, and I hope I had like an orientation seminar in Morrill Hall, and so I started to look into it a little bit more. Um, and uh, basically, the dean uh, uh, several years ago had a uh, little little news clip on it, and uh, it's uh, the the what we now think of some of the land grant stuff is is engagement. And I think uh, the talk that I'm going to talk through is that blending of the engineering arts and science with that engagement with the with the state. And before I did that, and there's several of you guys in the room, I tried to pull some photos and some projects some of the other faculty members that have worked with JTRP in the past have done, because I think it's really important to kind of understand um, as we're talking through these, these things. Many times our faculty or myself are working on projects that are in the press, and it's, those are not that right opportunity for the press release, and this is a good chance to recognize some of those faculty and then jump into what I'm going to talk about. So just to set the stage, and, and uh, um, uh, Nadia is in the audience, so you may debate those numbers in terms of freight, but this is one of those things like counting stars in the universe. Uh, the best number I've got is a lower bound on freight is $600 billion in freight moves to, through, or from, and it's going to be a lot more in the future. And, and I am certain that INDOT spends about a million dollars an hour uh, from looking at the budget. So those are kind of some of the gee whiz numbers on where there's an opportunity to have an impact. And really where we work in the JTRP arena, and this goes back many, many decades, Harold Michael and Camaris and so on, it's that intertwining of government, academics, and industry. And I used to use a three-legged stool, and now I use this triple helix because I talked to the education folks, and they said, really what you're doing is this, and they actually had a figure that I could like pull out. So I, it was kind of cool, like the engineering education folks had already had like a picture that explained this. So what I want to do is just kind of take a quick quick snapshot of some of the different things we work on before I like dive down into some of the minutia. And it's going to be, I think, a picture book approach that I think, even though you may not all be traffic engineers, and Andrew will probably say, well, I probably left some precision off this, but I hope you all walk away 
with a little bit of, of an understanding of how, how some of the traffic engineering concepts are evolving with probe data. Jan, this is a picture I grabbed from you a couple weeks ago. And some of the times uh, we've got faculty members, I mean, a little detail, a truck's burning up and they decide to park under a bridge. And, um, you know, Jan gets called in with a scanning electron microscope to, to see whether the beams are, are good or bad. Um, but those aren't really things that we can talk about and do press releases at the time as we're helping engage with the state on making the decision. Uh, Robert Frosch, just a couple weeks ago down in Evansville, there was a, a bridge uh, concrete beam and, you know, down there doing some inspection on how, how does it, how does it, uh, how is it going to, what's the life expectancy going to be? Kamaris and Sam Lobby engaging with the legislature on what is the right tolling. Nadia, you've got some uh, past uh, ties with several of those efforts. Uh, and the engagement with the state gives us that opportunity to have a huge living laboratory opportunity. Jason Weiss just built, they built six bridges around the state. They're going to be with us for the next 50 years for long-term monitoring. Uh, Monica is doing some great stuff with the piles down there at this US 52 with Rod um, that's really going to push the science forward in terms of how we can use some of these larger piles. Uh, Rodrigo has had huge impact on some of the cone penetrometer stuff he has done. He's had over 82,000 downloads of his work. This gives opportunities for the students to engage. Uh, we just had a couple of our, they were undergrads and other grad students do a little WLFI interview. Uh, we have other stakeholders on campus. I see Jim Krogmar here. I wished I'd put the supply chain in for, or the, uh, the, the, the convoy from the rumble strips up in uh, uh, Fort Wayne, but this one was really the supply chain logistics that some industrial engineering folks worked with is making sure you get the, the stone and the asphalt there in time uh, to do things better. Other units on campus, the, the airport with the, the UAS. Rob Connor has done some work with the, um, uh, out of the Sherman Mitten uh, closure four or five years ago, is now got an awesome site down there that he's actually doing a course on right now for inspecting beams. And I am, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I, sorry, uh, is just, just joined, joined into the group and has got a very cool uh, technology for basically measuring the width through the, the work zones where it's not safe to be out there measuring with a tape measure. So, long-winded preamble that there is a lot of engagement between faculty and the state and I think that is a huge opportunity for our students to have a just fantastic educational experience and then, and then map into the land grant uh, uh, mission. So um, now I'm going to focus on my, my details and um, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, I-65 bridge closure. Um, there are actually a number of faculty involved with this. You know, one of our former uh, faculty members, Rick Deschamps, uh, was actually the geotechnical engineer that came in and did a lot of work on the, the micropile stabilization. Uh, Rob Connor was out there monitoring, monitoring the, the, the pier tilt. Um, our mission really came in about uh, 30 minutes into the closure. Uh, one of my students got a call from one of the INDOT uh, colleagues and said, okay, we're closing a section of I-65. Um, and we're diverting traffic off at mile marker 141, and it's going to get back on at 193. That's a 52-mile detour. Uh, those of you who were in the community at that time were, were living that. And so the, there was absolutely no communication infrastructure and no sensing out there. And so this really becomes of how do you pull together sensing uh, and some ad hoc decision-making criteria using engineering principles so that we can uh, try to uh, make, make the best of, uh, of a less than ideal situation. So this is a team effort. Um, I didn't realize this was open to the students or I definitely would have invited the students, but um, this was one of those deals where, you know, within hours we're all huddling. This might not have been the picture we took that day. We were more worried about solving the problem. This might have been afterwards. But uh, similar cast of characters there. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is some of the uh, probe data concepts that we, we used and uh, part of this is, uh, is how some of the traffic engineering uh, areas are starting to morph as the connected vehicle technology comes in. And when I talk about connected vehicle technology, I'm talking about 
vehicles out there that can transmit back their position. And if you've got a new Ford or GM or BMW, um, all of those, I don't need to tell you, have some type of GPS on them. And whether you know it or not, there's generally an agreement in place for uh, some of that telematics data going back. Most of us just kind of say, I accept and don't really pay any attention to it. And then there's, uh, there's groups out there that are aggregating. And in fact, if you're running you know, a, an app on your phone and my 2001 F-150, I joke when it's sitting on the dashboard, that's a connected vehicle because it's a, the, the cell phone is out there uh, driving around. And historically, our traffic engineering approach, and you know, pick your number, you think back to civil engineering, um, 1,800, 2,000 vehicles per hour, your mileage may vary. That's the capacity of a lane. And you can make some estimation in terms of delay and utilization by dividing what's your demand, what's your volume, divided by what's your capacity. When that ratio gets over one, that's not good. And when it's a lot less than one, life is good. The problem that happens is when you get near one and you get over one on that ratio, you don't have a very good picture. And we don't, sensors on the interstate are very expensive. When we put a fixed sensing out there, power, communication, that's $100,000, one point. Um, so that's a, not a very scalable technology. Jim Krogmeyer's worked with me a lot on that. And the best you ever get is plus or minus 10% in the long term in terms of that. So what is happening now is we're now moving to a model. We're always going to have those basic traffic engineering fundamentals. But for decision making, if we can start leveraging that connected vehicle data, those probes out there, now we're measuring spatially, we have the ability to measure spatially over the network how we're doing instead of having just a few points. Imagine a 52 mile corridor. There's no way you can afford to put enough counters out there in real time to see what's going on. So how can we leverage those connected vehicles? And I think everybody in the audience here has worked with Google Maps or whatever you're, maybe you're an Apple Maps person, I don't know. But you, you know, green is good, red is bad. And, uh, but and that model works pretty good, but it doesn't really give you that system view. So what I'm going to talk about is how do you aggregate some of that information for decision makers so you don't just show them a map and say, well, at 2 a.m. it was green, so life was good, and it's all red now, so life is not good. You've got to kind of give them some numbers. And then you've got to, from the engineering perspective, you can start honing in on where are your problems and what might you be able to solve. So that probe data is a game changer. Um, and just to give you a, a, a feel for it, over the last five years, we have about 36 billion one-minute records for, 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 the, for the, the interstate network out there. So this is probably conceptually one of the more important graphics to get down. And all we're going to do on this is I'm going to show you month by month from Chicago to Louisville, our, uh, and I'm going to show you how many hours by milepost. So milepost zero is down here by Louisville. Milepost 252 is up there by Chicago. And I'm just going to pick uh, month by month and I'm going to draw this plot. And this tells me how many hours below 45 miles an hour that facility is operating at a particular location. And the reason that's kind of helpful and it's a, it's a quick swag at where spatially do I have my problems on the corridor. So now I've just uh, I've drawn that. And so we look right here, 2,600 hours of the year it's operating below 45. Um, and I understand 45 is a binary threshold and we can, we can look at how severe. But this is where Ohio and Indiana are spending, pick your number, $1.5 billion to put a new bridge in. This is the Indianapolis area where you've seen a lot of press releases where they're working on it. This is a construction zone. This is a construction zone. This is the ramps up toward Chicago. You can spatially see where, where the problems are. You can also go one level deep, and I like that plot, the other one, because it, it generally shows the same trends. Um, this is one that does month by month, and it uh, uh, shows Color-coded, green is good, purple is the 0 to 14 miles an hour. So you can start getting down to severity. And, and Nadia and Andrew, you know, when we start getting down to this 
aggregation now we can start getting some delay metrics and we can put some dollars on it. And this is probably a bit more useful for the kind of the economic analysis, but you can see it still shows the same basic trends. Louisville, Indianapolis, work zones, and we can see it. And a little bit different visualization. So from a high level, I hope from a traffic engineering perspective, I know we don't have everybody that's traffic engineers in here, but you can kind of see spatially this is a good way of con conveying to decision makers how a facility is operating. And then you can do some before and after. And this was before and after, before and after a construction project uh, between 2011, 2012. And you can kind of see uh, this is what it was, this is what it is, and that kind of gives you a nice before after picture in terms of how the conditions have changed, how the severity has, and then you put that with a nice number in terms of this is, and I think this one uh, might have been about $10 million in, in user benefits that accrued when the construction project was completed. And then you can do some longer term analysis over year by year, and then you can see this. So now this is kind of that audience participation. What do you think this big spike here in January 14 was? Snow. So that was what they were calling the polar vortex, right? That was that January that uh, we just kept getting hit with storm after storm. And then the other takeaway message on this, the best time to drive in Indiana is April. It's after winter weather and it's before summer construction season has started, right? Well, okay, oh, okay, so from Jan's perspective, yeah, that's right, good point. So, so different perspectives on, absolutely, right, probably the best time for pavement smoothness is this period of year, right? Good, 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 good audience participation. So I showed you spatially. Now let's look at temporally how you can look at probe data. And I'm going to pick on weather. And so I showed you January 14, the polar vortex. This one I'm going to pick was the Valentine storm, and this one caused some domestic harmony issues at home. I remember my wife asking me, why are you on the phone with NDOT on, at 6 o'clock on Valentine's Day? And I didn't have a really good answer when I said, well, we're looking at traffic ticker. But, um, so, but um, Valentine's Day storm was, uh, this was one, 270 miles of interstate were impacted that were below 45. And you don't need to get into the details, but this kind of gives you regions of the state um, in terms of what regions of the state were impacted. And this was, this was actually, a, this is a ticker that's used by them commonly right now for kind of monitoring situation assessment. How are they doing when there's a bridge closure, when there's a winter storm? And I want you to just see uh, visually, I want you to visualize traffic ticker before I talk about the detour route so that you can get a feel for what what you can look at on that. So this is a picture, and if any of you guys ever drive through the rest area at mile marker 149 on, on I-65, Tim Wells, one of our undergrads and grad students, actually was the one that designed that tower with the cameras on. Um, life is good at noon, and I got a dotted line there. And then you can see one hour later, so before, one hour later, it's starting to snow. This is just at that, that point. Now we're down to wheel tracks, and if you look up there, you can see uh, tighter headways. You know, pick your number. This is a narrow area of the, 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 the route within that, the state I'm looking at. So I don't know, almost 18 miles are impacted, and pick your number. You've got four miles that are there in purple. Purple is the 0 to 14 mile an hour range. And it goes on, and you can kind of see it's substantially over by 6 p.m., and then you're into some of that cleanup mode on the storm. So I show you this to kind of give you an idea of spatially how to assess probe data. And then temporally, you can, you can look at that and you can see about how long was it and about how severe was it. And depending on your threshold, if you want to know were we above 45 or were we above 14, you've got some pictograms. And you understand, you've got 12 inches of snow. Probably not everybody is going to be, 45 miles an hour might be an unreasonable expectation. And so you can then drill down and you can actually see, and I won't go into the details on it, but you can actually see in this particular storm how first it hits I, you know, the I-70 west and then the I-70 east and how it kind of tracks across the area. 
uh, and you can look at the severity. So now I've given you, I don't know, we're about 20 minutes into the preamble. I've told you about engagement. I've, I've told you about traffic ticker. And so now what I want to talk about is the detour route when you look at that particular corridor and, and what we pulled together. And the reason I wanted to give you that preamble is it's not like you can, with a couple hours notice, uh, assemble a team and figure out how to an analyze you know, thousands of records an hour. You've got to say, okay, what are, we, what are those tools that we've got? What's the hand we've dealt? What can we, we pull together? So we had 35,000 vehicles that were using that bridge. They're not using it. They're now detouring them through Lafayette and, and other paths. And uh, I think, Debbie, you uh, were talking to one of your friends that lives on 28 or 231. They said they, so State Route 28, they said they were living on Interstate 28. Uh, and literally, that was the back of the queue. And then they were, we, they were detouring traffic onto these two lane, two lane roads. Um, and Jan, as, as you'll appreciate, the, 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 somebody was looking out from above that we didn't get rain during that four week period. Because if we had got rain, the entire State Route 28 would have just fallen apart, right? Um, so we were very fortunate that it didn't rain. And the other challenge on these, and I think anybody that's working, you know, these engineering challenges, everybody that drives is a traffic engineer um, and has an opinion. And uh, the uh, friends at the Journal and Courier were out there live tweeting on, and they absolutely were right. It was about four hours to drive 60 miles that first day. That story was still replaying a couple, three days into it. And I want to kind of talk with you. And this is one of those things where you're trying to fix the problem and you're trying to figure out how to work with the media so they can communicate effective options. Because you, you can't alienate them. You've got to figure out how to, because they're a powerful tool to communicate what are the recommended routes going out to, 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 for people to use. So um, this is the detour route. Those of you probably have driven 52, you come across 28, you see lots of corn. We come up through campus, we've got a variety of signals that are not coordinated for northbound traffic. Um, we go up, we've got a left turn signal that's definitely not coordinated for making a left turn, it's coordinated for moving traffic on Sagamore Parkway. And then we've got up here, and then we had a flashing red stop there for safety reasons that kind of got forgotten about be while we're working on this part of the network. So, and these are what, and I said volumes are very hard to get. These were volumes we got, we pulled, we're able to pull from a traffic counter and it doesn't necessarily perfectly representative, but the big picture message is there's a big spike in volumes. So now let me tell you about what some of the students did to pull together what we're calling um, traffic ticker. And uh, so remember I told you about that, that spatial, I showed you that spatial map. So this was one where we said, okay, we want to just break this corridor up into pieces. So a piece here, a piece here, a piece here, a piece here, a piece here. So we can just start isolating where are those segments to look at. Because if you've got 53 miles, you can't just go out and just drive around, well, where am I going to fix the problems? You're trying to figure out what are the problems that are fixing themselves and what are the problems that we need to focus on. So as we look at speeds below 45 miles an hour and severity, and the projection bullets aren't lined up, but that's about five miles. It's pretty severe right there. And then we move on to the next sec segment across 28, and we've got some problems here. So the punchline right here is you've got unsignalized intersection, unsignalized intersection, and there is no, there's chaos at both of those causing major problems. Then we get into Lafayette. There's some signals here that need to have, there's some infrastructure there, but there needs to be some timing done. Some coordination up there on 28, more or less, things are pretty good. At this thing, we think, oh, things are pretty good. At this point, most of the problems are down here. We think, oh, we've got them on 231 going north. Life is, is pretty good. Um, and I'll tell you about these blips in, in just a minute. So um, 
the key thing is the journal and courier was absolutely right. I mean, there were 10 miles of that corridor operating below 14 miles an hour during the detour. And now the question is, okay, now how do you, how do you fix it? So, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of foreshadowing, then I'm gonna talk through the case, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna show you the call outs. The punchline is lots of purple here, really bad, not much purple by the time we finished. And, and we, can, we can dig into the individual cases, but um, the, the idea was performance measures, assess your problem, and then figure out how can you do some of the things that we typically take months to do and how can you do them overnight. Um, so, you know, for example, putting in a signal at 52 and, 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 and 47. At 52, we would never you know, Andrew is kind of thinking from a safety perspective, oh my gosh, why would we have a telephone pole in the clear zone on 52? And that's exactly, we wouldn't do that normally, but you can't like pour found concrete foundations and put up mast arms overnight, but you can get with the power company and you can plant a pole and, and get a reasonable hillbilly signal together strung between some uh, span wire. And those of you who know me, uh, know that I view hillbilly engineering very affectionately. I think Vince Drenovich has told me it's, the better term is swashbuckling engineering. Um, they're both good and you know, you can see, you know, our foundation here is a wooden pallet for the cabinet. Again, that's not a standard in dot detail, a wooden, wooden pallet. Um, and um, um, the similar deal down at, 50, at 28 and 231. And again, you know, it's kind of fun to see a team come together. You know, those of you who work with the power company and the cable company, you know, will be there next week between eight and five. And it was kind of interesting, you know, the power company was out there that night dropping, dropping service. And it's really, that's one of these things where it's really kind of fun to see the teams come together when it's like, okay, we're gonna solve the problem, we're worried about getting paid later. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a signal down at 28 and 231. So you guys have seen the top one is speeds below 45. This one is severity. Um, Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. So Friday night, everything's falling apart. You're starting to figure out, okay, let's, and we had students, if, you know, the, 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 the bridge closed about noon. If you see the start time, we had data feed coming in at 4 p.m. that day. So that was kind of cool. We didn't get the whole patch of it, but they mobilized, they partnered with the private sector company, they got the data coming in, and um, by Friday, Friday night, they're making decisions, and then they're getting uh, the first two signals in at 52 and 28 and 28 and 231. Those are the major bottlenecks, getting those in. And life still's not perfect, but you can see it's, it's a lot better than what it was. And at this point now, you start chasing those second order effects. So here's one of those second order effects. And again, when you have a throttling mechanism downstream where you're not getting people through, you tend not to think so much about that. This, any of you guys have drive uh, 231 north up to 28, um, it, years ago, it used to be a flashing yellow, and maybe three or four years ago, they converted it to a flashing red. Um, and so you can see that turned into be a major problem. You know, pick your number. Five miles were queued up at a rural flashing red indication, right? So again, those are, these are the things that if you're trying to deal with driving up and down the corridor or listen to citizen calls or the paper, you don't have quantitative data. But when you've got this kind of data coming in, you can see, ah, here's the problem. Now let's see what we can do. So literally this boils down to getting a bucket truck out there and changing it from a flashing red to a flashing yellow. Um, and you realize, again, there's some safety trade-offs on this, right? I mean, um, but not that much because when you have long, a sustained queue like that, you've actually, um, you actually had a fairly severe back of queue crash there um, with people queued up at that. So it's probably, um, this is in, on balance, this was probably a, a better safety improvement changing to flashing yellow. So now um, they're through kind of the major hurdles 
Now the next part is incident response. And those of you who are certainly Nadia and Andrew, you know you've worked with the incident response uh, folks before. Urban areas are very good at realizing that when you have a car fire or something like that, you don't bring all your fire trucks out and block all the lanes. That makes a very safe environment to work the scene, but it doesn't always you create long queues. And so part of this was kind of some outreach to TEMA, the local volunteer fire departments, and then working to see what we could do with the signal coordination in this area. And so brought a group together. Um, this is that chance now to start bringing in that input. Here's what we got to do to communicate out. Uh, and again, uh, GS, you're asking about the students. I mean, the students are, are Maggie right there. I think you know Maggie. They're, they were front and center in this dialogue. And it's really kind of fun when you see the students the, you know, making a recommendation and then like they're like implementing it that afternoon. Um, and then in the, uh, the signal coordination uh, phase, we had no data, so I have no idea what was going on. We had no cellular drops there. Uh, bottom line, Andrew and Nadia, you'll know, we put some common cycle lengths in there. We did some coordination. We were actually very fortunate, whoops, oh, um, very fortunate um, uh, one of our um, um, one of our students' uh, master's thesis project was on those three intersections, so we had three cellular communication drops in there. For the non-traffic engineers in here, all you need to look at this is this was an uncoordinated signal. Put a common cycle length in there. Adjusted the offset so these black dots line up in the green bands. The black dots are vehicles. And the idea is synchronize the signal so most of the vehicles arrive on green. Um, went through and we did that. And this is where you start seeing right here, you can see all this orange right here. And the orange starts kind of, the amplitude goes down. That was, that was the impact of the signal coordination. So now it wasn't severe. Um, so we didn't necessarily change a lot of the, 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 the segment problems, but we definitely made, now it's that, instead of driving to one signal, stopping, waiting 30 seconds, driving to the next, that's not a great, uh, great way to facilitate progression. That worked pretty well. Then we moved into, this was that incident management response. And again, urban areas are well coordinated on this. This is where, um, uh, this was a very unfortunate uh, crash that had absolutely nothing to do with the detour, this was a crossover crash just south of the Dairy Queen on 52. It was a fatal, um, but because of that, you can see the, the big, big spike on that. Um, this was exit 193, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, a truck taking the corner too fast and rolling over. Um, again, causes some problems, and then this one was a truck driving a mobile home that got lost and took a corner and got hung up and blocked the detour route. These are those, these are those things you just can't make up, but <laughs> cause major disruptions when you're, you're, there's, there was very little network uh, redundancy. And that's why you, know, you go back to that picture of coordinating with public safety. This is where you know, getting those lines of communication between these decentralized agencies that normally don't have any direct communication, getting that established so you can get that quick, quick resolution and, and get, uh, get the, the response out there. The last thing I'm going to talk about now is um, uh, the assessment we did with, with some Bluetooth tracking. And all this, all this really boils down to is think about a way of electronically recording the license plates on cars and matching them um, 20, 30 miles apart. Um, it wasn't done that way. It was done by uh, people who have discoverable Bluetooths on their phone. You record the anonymous MAC address. And if you know they are here at one point and you see that same phone or same car up here 30 minutes later, you've got a very good way of estimating that path-based or that uh, speed, uh, travel time. And we also can do some origin destination. And part of the thing 
particularly when people start using Google Maps and Apple Maps, is the user equilibrium starts kicking in because you start getting some recommendations for some alternate routes. And so we did this fairly late. Believe me, we didn't do this day two or three. This was like day, you know, week three is like things are settling down and like the students are saying, okay, where are there some cool research opportunities to, to look at here? And they looked at, and it was really from A to B, that 141 to 193, and in a perfect world, I've kind of shown those arrows blue and green going up to that point. But I showed it this way because I think for people who are familiar with the Lafayette area, it might make a little more sense. So the red was what INDOT was communicating to the media, what they had on the sign, what we communicated to Google, and all those folks. This is the recommended detour route. This is particularly commercial vehicles. This is what we want them on. Green and blue are what people are doing ad hoc with navigation and local knowledge. And a couple of them, you know, a couple, a couple variations going straight on 52 or cutting through town and coming up um, through uh, River Road. And then we all experience those as users in this community. We saw that happening. And the thought that I was just remarkable was how co close user equilibrium was. You know, it was that, you know, you're, you're always wondering, you know, you know, not in, Andrew know, you know, the whole, it's not a perfect science, but user equilibrium usually does kick in. You know, within a minute, those routes between here and here were all pretty comparable. So it was kind of, and then if you think about it, that was a 52 mile route. So my simple math, I'm just going to drive a mile a minute. So 52, 52, uh, 52 minutes, and I realize your mileage may vary if you drive 70, but let's, so 52 minutes, uh, uh, between here and here, maybe that's a truck, and we're doing that in 64 minutes. That's not too bad for, for a detour route. Once you've communicated with the truck, trucking industries in the border states, hey, take alternate routes, um, communicate with the media, and, and do your best to optimize this corridor, um, that's not too bad a result. And uh, the other thing is, this really wasn't our function, but the INDOT public relation folks, it was within a couple days they were able to feed this in the media. Turned out it, it went from the, you know, the nightmare on 65 to, I won't say they were ringingly endorsing the corridor, and not that you really want that, but the, the story had changed. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, the, the thing I want, you know, the, the colleagues in here to hear about is, you know, the impact the students had, had on them, and they had. That's in, and you know, Monica, I know you're living it right now with those piles uh, down there on, on, on 52. And it's really kind of those magic moments when you start seeing those, those engage. The students did a very nice uh, technical paper summarizing this. Um, Ohio DOT now has a traffic ticker that they've been using in their construction zone. Utah DOT, the students over spring break put uh, a traffic ticker together uh, for Utah. Um, this is an older one that predates, but you saw that uh, I-65 uh, ORB. Um, some of those graphics go back to 2012, but this is a federal highway kind of recommended practice for, for sharing those uh, results. And again, we didn't invent all this stuff uh, in August last year. This was how do we cherry pick what we've got right now, what can we pull together? And um, the, uh, it was, it was uh, the, the blue ribbon panel that went to the governor in 2014, but the students were very proud that they copied all of the graphics out of the mobility report that show, you know, the in congestion in Indianapolis, the, the work zones, and the, the, those things went into the, the report. And then most recently, uh, they put together a, a ticker for, for Riyadh. So that's my uh, pitch on the, the detour route. It was absolutely nothing that I would argue that we want to do, but it's always kind of fun when you can take some existing tools, partner with the local community, um, the press, the decision makers, and uh, I will use Vince's term of swashbuckling engineering, not uh, hillbilly engineering, and, 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 and you know, put together a team to define what you're going to measure, implement some things, and then uh, tweak the system. And that's really what engineering is about. 
Normally, we like to do it a little more controlled. We like to have a nice data set, make some decisions, and make some consensus, but sometimes you don't have that luxury. With that said, I'm going to put a shameless plug in. We're going to have a field trip to the ORB project on October 28th. This will be about a 14-hour odyssey. Uh, we'll start at 6 a.m. We'll probably get back about 8 p.m. But um, we will go down to the new tunnel. Uh, we will be out on that bridge that now goes across. Um, historically, we get about 30 to 35 Purdue students, 30 to 35 INDOT students. Monica, I see you're writing it down. I hope you'll get some of your students uh, there. GS, I know I've been lobbying to get some of the, the freshmen there. I know it's kind of 14-hour block on a Friday kind of cuts into classes a little bit. Um, but um, it's also it's a good chance to, it has absolutely nothing to do with the detour route, but it's a chance to meet some INDOT colleagues. And if you think back to that graphic I showed at the beginning with the ORB bridges going in to solve those 2,600 hours of congestion down there, it's really cool to see a $1.5 billion project and talk to a lot of our grads that have been involved in the environmental aspect, the geotechnical aspect, the construction aspect, um, and so on.